Well, today uh, we are going to be looking at a psalm, uh, and I invite you to turn, if you, if you're, you have your, uh, your Bibles, uh, you can turn with me uh, to Psalm 73. Uh, I'm going to be reading this psalm from the ESV, it's, and uh, so hear now the, the word of the Lord from Psalm 73. A psalm of Asaph. Truly God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. But as for me, my feet had almost stumbled. My steps had nearly slipped, for I was envious of the arrogant when, when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. For they have no pangs until death. Their bodies are fat and sleek. They are not in trouble as others are. They are not stricken like the rest of mankind. Therefore, pride is their necklace. Violence covers them as a garment. Their eyes swell out through fatness. Their hearts overflow with follies. They scoff and speak with malice. Loftily, they threaten oppression. They set their mouths against the heavens, and their tongue struts through the earth. Therefore, his people turn back to them and find no fault in them, and they say, how can God know? Is there knowledge in the Most High? Behold, these are the wicked, always at ease. They increase in riches. All in vain have I kept my heart clean and washed my hands in, in innocence. For all the day long I have been stricken and rebuked every morning. If I had said, I will speak thus, I would have betrayed the generation of your children but when I thought how to understand this, it seemed to me a wearisome task until I went into the sanctuary of God. And then I discerned their end. Truly, you set them in slippery places. You make them fall to ruin. How they are destroyed in a moment, swept away utterly by terrors. Like a dream when one awakes, O oh Lord, when you rouse yourself, you despise them as phantoms. When my soul was embittered, when I was pricked in heart, I was brutish and ignorant. I was like a beast toward you. Nevertheless, I am continually with you. You hold my right hand. You guide me with your counsel, and afterward you will receive me to glory. Whom have I in heaven but you? And there is nothing on earth that I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. For behold, those who are far from you shall perish. You put an end to everyone who is unfaithful to you. But for me it is good to be near God. I have made the Lord God my refuge, that I may tell of all your works. Bow with me one more time as we go before the Lord to ask his blessing. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you today for your word. We thank you that you are our holy God, and as we have received your word today, we ask that you will bless it to our, our consideration. Lord, open it to us by your spirit, that we might benefit from it. We pray that we would apply it to live lives for you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, our text today, Psalm 73, begins with the inscription of Psalm of Asaph. Psalm of Asaph. It's probably a, a name that um, you've seen before. It's, he is, uh, is, is one to whom a number of our psalms are attributed. And we learn something about Asaph if we go back to First Chronicles, I think, chapter 16. We find out that Asaph was a Levite. He was one of those who had responsibility for the, uh, the care of the tabernacle and other temple duties. He was uh, responsible, along with the other Levites, to help God's people worship. And Levite was, uh, this particular Levite, Asaph, was, was uh, appointed by King David uh, to be in particular, particularly in charge of the musical worship of God. So it's therefore not so surprising that we find more than one psalm that's uh, ascribed to him. Asaph, therefore, must have been quite a spiritual man and uh, one who was uh, trusted by, by King David to serve in a, in a very, in more than adequate way before the Lord. But 
What we find as we read through this psalm, I hope to show you today, is that even though Asaph was a godly man, he was, in fact, one who was tempted to fall into a pit of discontentment. And we'll see that as uh, we go through this. But as, uh, as many commentators have noted, uh, not only does he fall into this pit of discontentment, but he, he rises out of it. There's a, there's a kind of spiritual recovery that occurs in this psalm. And so that he is elevated to one of the highest plateaus of spirituality, perhaps expressed uh, in the Old Testament. So uh, I'd like to consider this psalm with you today under three heads. Uh, the first is the problem of discontentment. The second will be the four steps of spiritual recovery to contentment, to, to spiritual contentment. And finally, we'll consider the last uh, few verses under the topic, my portion forever, taking that from, from uh, verse 26. So first of all, the problem of contentment. As, uh, as this psalm begins, uh, Asaph says, truly God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. So uh, the, the first uh, is, a, is a spiritual truth that, that uh, Asaph does acknowledge. God is good to Israel. God is good to the, to the church. Israel was the Old Testament church. We could say that uh, about the church today. God is good uh, to the church, but he qualifies it to those who are pure in heart those who are um, walking with the Lord, those who have a heart for God. It's not just one, th it's one thing to be in the church, to be present, but it's another to have a heart that's turned to the Lord. It's not enough to only be merely a part of, of, the, of the church without having a heart that is turned to the Lord. So he starts out there, but you see that it follows on quickly uh, that in verse 2 he says, but as for me, my feet had almost stumbled. And we're going to see that the reason for Asaph to express this is that he was not content with the way things were. He wasn't, he wasn't uh, perhaps happy about the circumstances that he saw around him. And so uh, we have to think for a moment, what is contentment? Uh, Paul in Philippians 4 verse 11 says, I've learned in whatever situation I am to be content. But what is contentment? Well, uh, the English Puritan Jeremiah Burroughs defined contentment in his book, The Rare Jewel of, of Christian Contentment, as that sweet, inward, gr quiet, gracious frame of spirit which freely submits to and delights in God's wise and fatherly disposal in every condition. That's what contentment is. In other words, to be content means that we need to to recognize that whatever circumstance we find ourselves, that's a circumstance that's designed by God. And if we're not content with that, of course, then we're actually not really content with what God has for us. We're perhaps, uh, perhaps some of us find uh, that we uh, grumble from time to time about the way things are, about the way something is. It doesn't meet our expectation. We can find many examples of that in, uh, in the Old Testament when, when the Israelites were in the wilderness. Uh, it was more than one time that they were unhappy about not having water, not having food, not having this, not having that. Uh, they grumbled on a fairly regular basis before, before God. And really what they were doing is they were grumbling against uh, what God was doing for them. And perhaps they thought that things would be um, clear skies and, and uh, clear sailing, sunny skies and clear sailing. But uh, the Lord doesn't pro promise that, of course, to, to his people. In fact, in the New Testament, in 1 Peter uh, chapter 4, verse 12, Peter says, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. And Peter says there are going to be times of trials. There are going to be times of difficulties. And as children of God, God gives us those trials. He gives us those uh, difficult circumstances in order to strengthen our faith, in order, order to cause us to uh, cling to him more closely, in order to lay aside uh, the, the temptations and the idols of the world. 
So if we recognize this, it should not surprise us when we encounter such trials. You may have been in such discouragement yourself, or you may be unhappy with some of your circumstances. And if you are, well, then you're in close company with Asaph. You may be in exactly the same place he is. You, you may be in a situation where your steps are um, uh, almost uh, nearly slipped or your feet have nearly stumbled. Um, but uh, we're going to see here in the, in the next few verses, the, the, uh, even more in a more particular way, what was causing Asaph to walk in such, with such uh, un, unbelief. In verse 3, we see that Asaph was envious uh, towards the arrogant. He first of all sees that they are um, not only arrogant, but they're also prosperous. He says they're the prosperity of the wicked. Uh, and then when we get to verse 4 and 5, we see that um, Asaph regards their lives and sees that they have no pangs until death. Their bodies are fat and sleep. They are leading happy, carefree lives, so to speak. Uh, they are um, going along without seems a care in the world. Some of us may have also seen others around us who seem to live such happy lives. Maybe uh, we have been in the, in, uh, if we've worked alongside of others, maybe we've taken a principled approach, but we see uh, our neighbor doing something maybe not so, so principled, and yet they get ahead. They get, uh, they get the, the, the greater accommodation. They get the greater promotion. Maybe they get the bigger uh, bonus or the, or the larger office or some other larger response. And we might say, well, that isn't fair. Uh, that doesn't seem to be, uh, doesn't seem that God is doing the right thing in this situation. Well, we have to remember, of course, that the Lord doesn't promise that we will always have uh, easy, easy going. Uh, we can think of a number of examples in Scripture where uh, there was a circumstance. For example, uh, Jacob had to serve under his father-in-law Laban for a, a number of years. It seemed that he was really tricked into having to work for both of his wives. Joseph was sold into slavery by his brothers. That doesn't seem to be the right thing either. So we can, we can cite many examples, but we have to remember that in all of them, God is sovereign, and that this was, their, this was his plan for his people. But things even appear worse as we get to verse 6 in our text, um, Asaph points out that their pride is their necklace. Violence covers them as a garment. They are really uh, very proud of their ungodliness. They're wearing it. They're wearing their ungodliness, if you like, on, on their sleeves. And as we go down through this text, we finally arrive in verse 11, and we see here they say, how can God know? Is their knowledge in the Most High? And really what the, the wicked are doing are really saying, uh, who cares? How can God even care? They, they are boasting in the face of God. They're really boasting in a, such a way as to uh, suggest that God does not exist or God, God does not know anything. And they do that, and yet they seem to suffer no ill. They continue to win awards and gain praise from society and, and receive uh, what seems to be great things. And so Asaph was, I think we could say, was undone by his envy, for this is the uh, successful, seemingly successful, but ungodly people in the world. And it's easy to identify with Asaph. Uh, it's easy to identify with, with him. He was, he was um, upset because uh, God was being mocked and, and also his people were being mocked. But we have to remember, of course, that God is sovereign. God ena enables all of these things to occur for his own good will. But Asaph's descent into discontentment uh, goes a little further, and we see it in verses 12 and 13. In, in verse 12, we say, Behold, these are the wicked, always at ease. They increase in riches. And then he, look what Asaph concludes. All in vain have I kept my heart clean. All in vain. Asaph arrives at a place where he says, Is it, Was it really worth it to serve the Lord? It seems like all is foolishness. My faith is foolish if this is the way things are, are, are today. 
And of course, this is a complete untruth. It's really blasphemy for Asaph to even think this. A godly man like Asaph should know better, but his envy of the, of the successful and righteous had led to um, this self-pity and eventually to denying the value of serving God. But we see that, of course, when we go back to verse 2, Asaph said that his feet had almost stumbled, my steps had nearly slipped. He didn't actually fully uh, stumble or slip, but he came close to it. And we see that he um, regains his perspective in the following verses. In verse 15, he said, I would have betrayed the generation of your children if, if I were to speak thus. He recognizes that this is not the right way to be thinking. Um, if he had said such things, he would have had a bad influence on the next generation, on, on children and children's children and others. And this is a good reminder, of, again, as to why uh, we need to be a part of a, a Christian community. We need to be a part of the church. Uh, we need to be around others. And uh, so even when we get into a position of, of uh, discontent or discouragement, we need to be with others. But then we get to the uh, recovery that Asaph really has to spiritual contentment, beginning in, uh, in verses 16 and 17. And there are, are, I'm going to suggest there are four specific things we're going to see over the coming verses here. Asaph has reached this point of, um, of discouragement. He's reached the point where he wonders, is it, is it um, worth serving the living God? And then he says in verse 16, but when I thought how to understand this, it seemed to me a wearisome task until I went into the sanctuary of God. This is the pivot point in this psalm, by the way. Uh, he sees now that he needs to do something different. What does he do? Well, he goes to the temple. He goes to church, if you like, you're putting it in sort of modern, modern terms. He went to the temple where he would, was, would, would worship the Lord. We have an even a greater blessing uh, worshiping as God's people here together. We worship uh, in the light of the accomplished redemption of our Lord and Savior with the gift of his Holy Spirit. But he went to gather with God's people, and there he was reminded of God's promises. He's reminded that God is in their midst, that God promises to draw near, just as he promises to draw near to us and meet with us today. So when Asaph went to the temple, he was, uh, he was confronted with an almighty God, a God who is uh, glorious, a God who is sovereignly powerful, a, a, he, a God who is a savior. And of course, that, uh, as, he, as he gazes upon uh, God in the temple, his, his perspective begins to change. Uh, that's, of course, a good application for us, too, uh, to remember how important uh, uh, being in worship is Lord, uh, Lord's Day by Lord's Day. Um, I've, I've spoken to many over, over the years uh, who have uh, perhaps had a good start in their Christian walk, uh, where it was involved in, in reading their Bible and going to church, but at some point they became uh, stagnant in their faith. They began to, 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 uh, to walk away from the Lord. And very often in those cases, when I've spoken with such individuals, I find that one of the things, one of the first things they did was they stopped going to church. And of course, it's in church where God is feeding us by the ordinary means that he's appointed by his word, by his prayer, and of course, the sacraments. So if we're not in, in worship, uh, we're, we're not going to be growing in our faith. Martin Lloyd-Jones stated it this way, people who neglect attendance at the house of God are not only being unscriptural, let me put it bluntly, they are fools. And so if we are not with the Lord, we are going to be, uh, we're going to be uh, certainly blunting our ability uh, to grow in Him. When we gather for worship uh, on the Lord's Day, may it be that our eyes would be on God, not so much on ourselves. May it be that we would desire to be with Him and to take our eyes off of the things of the world. Uh, so as Asaph uh, explains in, in this psalm, this is what changed his, pers his perspective. He goes, really, as you read through the psalm, you, you see he goes from self-pity to adoration as we move on to the later verses in, in this chapter. So coming into this 
into the sanctuary was the first step. The second step we see is in verses 17 uh, through 20. He says, Then I discerned the end. Truly you set them in a slippery places. You make them fall to ruin. How they are destroyed in a moment, swept away utterly by terrors, like a dream when one awakes. O oh Lord, when you rouse yourself, you despise them as phantoms. One of the things that helped Asaph to recover from his spiritual discontentment was to, to remember that he was worshiping a God who is holy, a God who is just, and a God who will one day judge the wicked. Those who seem to have such an easy life, do, seem to have no pains in the world, were not going to be able to, to uh, reach heaven that way. There is going to be a day of accounting uh, for them. And they are actually on a very slippery foundation. Uh, it's, it reminds us in the Sermon on the Mount when Jesus in, in Matthew chapter 7 tells the story of, of two men who are building. One, you might recall, builds his house on the rock. The other builds his house on sand. And what happens to so that one who builds his house on sand? Jesus says that the, the, uh, the rains fall, the floods come, the winds blow, and that house is, it falls, and great is the fall of it. And so the question is, are we building on a foundation of, of uh, our own desires, our own, our own making, or are we building on the rock, which is, of course, the Lord Jesus Christ? So when we see those that are perhaps doing uh, well in the world, and we, instead, of, instead of envying them, we should really, in some sense, pity them and plead for them that they would repent of their sin and turn to the Lord Jesus Christ because their end otherwise will be um, a, very, a very sad one. Only when we have this perspective uh, can we turn from uh, discontent about our own circumstances. Uh, instead of complaining about God, we will become more fervent in prayer and also that uh, we would be more somber in our lives and perhaps be uh, able to be a, a more diligent witness to those around us. Well, the third step in Asaph's spiritual recovery of contentment is found in verses 21 and 22. When my soul was embittered, when I was pricked in heart, I was brutish and ignorant. I was like a beast toward you. And that's kind of an interesting little expression there by Asaph. What is he, what's he really saying? Well, I think to try to summarize it very briefly, what Asaph is saying is that when he considers this from a godly perspective, he realizes that his attitude is just as bad as the attitude and the thinking of the ungodly. The ungodly act as if there is no God. They act like brute beasts in the, in the face of God. And in some sense, what Asaph is doing when he said all is vain, he's doing exactly, he's doing exactly the same thing. Uh, so this is why Asaph needs, uh, the, realizes that he is only differ, different from uh, the ungodly because he has salvation. His sins have been paid for. He is one who is, who is uh, uh, living a life of repentance, just as we are called to live a life of repentance. Blessed are the, the poor in spirit, for there is the kingdom of heaven. So Asaph recognizes that he, other, apart from salvation, Apart from salvation in the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, he would be living and thinking exactly like the ungodly who seems so successful. So we see, first of all, in, these, in the first three steps of uh, his recovery, Asaph goes, he goes to the temple to worship God. That resets his perspective. Second of all, he sees uh, a holy God who will one day judge the wicked, so he sees uh, the punishment that awaits those that do not, uh, do not uh, profess their faith in the Lord. And third, we see that apart from God's saving work through the Lord Jesus Christ, um, the end for the ungodly is, is the same as it is, uh, is, it would be ours as well. It's only because we are in Christ that we are saved from that judgment. Which brings us to our fourth uh, step in his spiritual recovery in verses 23 and 24. Nevertheless, I am continually with you. 
you hold my right hand, you guide me with your counsel, and afterward you will receive me to glory. Asaph is uh, saying here that even though he is a, a great sinner, that his God is still with him. His God is taking him by the hand. He is going to help him through this life and lead him into glory. Uh, he understands, of course, that this is not something he can do by his own strength. It's, we're, we're, we're saved by grace uh, through faith in Jesus Christ alone. And, and of course, again, uh, it is only because Christ has uh, fulfilled the demands of the law on our behalf, and because his precious blood, a blood that has infinite worth, was shed for us, that we can come before him. Uh, it's because of this that we can know God and we can be uh, assured that the Lord will be with us all, all of the way through our lives. And so uh, if we believe this, uh, then, of course, we still might say, why are we unhappy? Why, why is it the Lord hasn't done for us that w what we think he should have done for us? But if we recognize that what we, have, what we are not getting, what, which we do deserve, which is God's judgment, that's what we, we really deserve is God's judgment. And in fact, we're getting what we don't deserve, which is God's grace, God's mercy. Then it helps us to understand God's purpose for our lives. Asaph, I think, um, recognizes this, uh, and um, he recognizes that God has saved him because of the shed blood of the Savior, who he, 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 does, he did not know in the same way we do, but he is, has the same trust and the same faith. And, and though we might have trials in this life and, and uh, testings, yet we know that God has them as instruments for our own our own growth, that we might grow closer to him. Well, that brings us to the final portion of this psalm, and I've called it my portion forever, taking that from, from uh, verse, um, verse uh, 26. Uh, in this psalm, again, we see the fact that uh, Asaph is sunk to this low point in uh, his uh, contentment, his discontent. It's a spiritual descent, but he's also... Uh, now um, come to the point to recognize that when he said that it was vain to trust uh, in God, that that was wrong. In fact, that's the same lie that Satan used with our first parents in the garden, if you think of it for a moment. And then we see Asaph climbing to a glorious height in verse 25. Whom have I in heaven but you? And there is nothing on earth that I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Uh, I think that's why this psalm is interesting, that, that in the, the middle of the psalm, Asaph makes such a statement of unbelief, but here he makes such a great statement of faith and such a great statement about uh, our God. Uh, he, uh, God is our, the strength of my heart and my portion forever. If we have Jesus Christ as our Savior, then we all can make that same statement. It's true now, it was true for Asaph, and it's true for our eternal destiny. Uh, Jeremiah Burroughs, in, in the rare jewel of, of uh, Christian contentment, writes something which is in your bulletin. I put it there, or I asked uh, Sean to add it there for your consideration, but I'm just going to read it uh, here. It says, it is not necessary for me to be rich but it is necessary for me to make my peace with God. It's not necessary that I should live a pleasurable life in this world, but it is absolutely necessary that I should have pardon of my sin. It is not necessary that I should have honor and preferment, but it is necessary that I should have God as my portion and have my part in Jesus Christ. It is necessary that my soul should be saved in the day of Jesus Christ. The other things are pretty fine indeed, and I should be glad if God would give me them, a fine house and income and clothes and advancement for my wife and children. These are comfortable things, but they are not the necessary things. I may have these and yet perish forever, but the other is absolutely necessary. So this is clearly the position, I think, that Asaph has arrived at. And in verse 27, we read, For behold... 
Those who are far from you shall perish. You put an end to everyone who is unfaithful to you. But for me, it's good to be near God. I have made the Lord God my refuge, that I may tell all your works. And so it is a great, um, it's a great honor to be, to be um, the Lord's, to know him and to be living uh, for him. And this is something that we can enjoy. We don't have to live a life of discontentment, but we can sh share Asaph's uh, love for being near the Lord, being near his people, being less concerned about the world, uh, being more concerned about the things of God, faith, hope, love, service to God, being more concerned perhaps about our witness to the world. Uh, these things will give not only a present joy, but they'll give us a contentment that will, will never end and a glory that will never fade away. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we give thanks today that you give us life in and through the work and, and life of your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you that uh, Jesus Christ came from the heights of heaven and that you showed uh, your mercy to us through him, that we know that as many as received you who have uh, believed in your name, you gave the right to become children of God. And so we ask that, Lord, you would cause us, direct us uh, to seek you in all things. We pray that you would help us more and more to see your love for us, even in the time of testing and trial. May, Lord, it draw us ever closer to you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.